<laughs> okay, so ladies and maybe gentlemen uh, on the line, I don't know. So welcome to this afternoon session, uh, the program which is within the section policy and uh, policy implementation. Uh, my name is uh, Alena Hola, but the most important task will be done by uh, Catherine, uh, who is an established author and applied linguistic with rich experience in higher education. She is head of East Asian Languages at LSE program, director for BCS International Relations in Chinese, etc. So I will pass words to her, and she will introduce the, her panelists. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. And hi, everybody. Uh, hope you also enjoy this new experience online virtually. So let me just first uh, share my screen. Can you all see it? Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. So I think we are all here because you all have some kind of interest to do with Chinese language teaching. And our main focus for today's discussion is about sustainability in teaching Chinese as a foreign language and a truly UK perspective. Actually, we have a range of uh, colleagues from different parts of the country to share their expertise. So um, I was very honored to be invited to chair this uh, session today. Mm -hmm. And actually the question initially posed to me uh, by the conference organizer is that, hey, Catherine, we've noticed we have a lot of students started learning Chinese, but then they stop. Can you help us? What's the reason behind that, right? So then we start to look at some of the questions. Is it to do with language motivation in general? Is it to do with the way that we taught our program? Is it to do with the challenge of learning Chinese characters? And then I add this last bit about COVID-19 because that's the reality we're facing now, whether that will also have some kind of an impact in terms of uh, teaching Chinese as foreign language. So as the panel chair today, so my job is to introduce all three of my lovely panelists. And I will also set a little of scene of the language policy in the UK and how Mandarin Chinese actually fit into that. So as you can see in terms of format, so I will introduce all the panelists and tell you a little bit about Mandarin teaching in the UK. And then this is going to be the sequence of our speakers. And uh, they will talk about 10 minutes each. I really hope towards the end, we will have some kind of an open discussion and taking any Q&A from the audience. Okay, so first I want to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Duo Wan from University of Edinburgh. So she is the Chinese language program director there and been teaching about 16 years within the UK higher education and has strong sector recognition for her innovative teaching approach to Chinese language. And she's been presented at a range of different conferences and also published papers in language teaching and the learning strategy. And our second presenter will be Mr. Wei Shao from University of Cardiff. And he's a lecturer there in Chinese studies. And he is also associate lecturer in Chinese at the Open University. And before that, he's worked at University of Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield, lots of experience working in different universities in the UK. And his recent scholarship involve, involves in production of undergraduate level as well as GCSE Chinese textbooks. And his research interest is in pedagogy and the second language acquisition. And our, our final speaker is Dr. Li Jin Shi, actually my colleague from London School of Economics. And she's got a PhD in technology enhanced language learning. And she's a coordinator of many Chinese at LSE and won teaching excellence award twice at LSE. And she also contributed to UK's first distance learning Chinese course at the Open University as well. Her um, main research interests involve dynamic assessment, eye tracking and intercultural communication competence. So these are my wonderful uh, panelists and they will share their expertise later on. So I thought, let me tell you a little bit about, about the UK language policy and Chinese learning. Nowadays, we all ask Google, right? But unfortunately, when you put UK policy on language learning, the first thing coming up on um, Google said, England, there's currently no specific policy on languages at all. Um, a little bit good news in terms of Welsh language. So this is by the Welsh government. There's a strategy to preserve Welsh language. And this is from the 
Scottish government website, there is a Scots language policy as well recently introduced. Um, we have a little bit of good news. So there's a new UK language strategy report just published in July 2020 and really sets a UK-wide strategy in terms of how we approach language education and skills. So here you can see in terms of the short-term action, um, you know, in a way it's kind of uh, embarrassing to see how much effort we still need to say the awareness raising in terms of how important to learn other language, despite of course the dominant uh, status of English. And then this is the one to five years kind of a uh, longer term uh, actions. So this is quite interesting. So divided into different stages and also has a stronger um, emphasis in terms of teachers' education and retention. And towards the end, is stress also about mobility and also vocational and technical language training. So where does Mandarin Chinese fit into all of this? So there are three different areas Mandarin Chinese has been mentioned. Um, the first thing is in the UK, so Mandarin, uh, similar as Arabic and Russian, has been considered or defined as less widely studied, but strategically important language, okay? And the second aspect being mentioned is about UK government's uh, emphasize on mobility. So this is a scheme actually at the um, university higher education level called Generation UK to support students to actually gain experience in China. And finally, there's a very important actually uh, program at the school level called Mandarin Excellence Program. So the aim, it, it's actually, this is now already in the fifth year with the aim to actually produce about 5,000 uh, pupils fluent, to be fluent in Chinese by the end of this year. So what is the outlook then in terms of Mandarin learning and teaching in the UK? We also have some kind of mixed messages. So this is um, a blog post published by UCL, Institute of Education. By the way, they are the delivery, the, the main uh, organizer for the Mandarin Excellence Program. So according to their blog in February 2019, actually there are more children. There's a what they call a growing trend in learning Mandarin, and therefore they are calling for more qualified Mandarin teachers. Um, but funny enough, um, from the Economist, just literally the last edition, you know, in published on 27th of August this year, saying, oh, there actually is a decline in studying Chinese in Britain. And their reason actually is talk about it's really difficult language to learn and you have to put in so much energy and resources in order to reach to the same level and secure jobs as if you invest your energy in learning other European languages. So, so this really tie into very well into what we are discussing today, right? So is it worth the effort? What are the tricks? Why students you know, stop? And how can we actually encourage them and making sure there is, there is indeed a sustainable development in teaching Chinese as a foreign language. So without further ado, let me just pass on to Dr. Luan to talk about curriculum design and uh, sustainability, sorry, development in teaching Chinese as a foreign language. Let me just stop sharing. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, in this, uh, uh, in my uh, uh, presentation, I will just use our University of Edinburgh as a case study to demonstrate the curricular design. Uh, Please let me show my screen first. Just let me a second. Can you see the full screen now? Yeah. Okay. All right. Hi. Uh, so at the first, it's very nice to meet you all via this platform. Um, my name is Luan Duo. I'm the Chinese Language Program Director from University of Edinburgh. Today, I will use our uh, language program as a case study to demonstrate you how we design our curricula in order to ensure the sustainable development of a Chinese language program. Uh, right. Okay, so how to create a stable, continuous, uh, sustainable learning environment for modern language teaching and learning? 
I think this is a million dollar questions. As we could see, uh, like uh, uh, Catherine just mentioned, there's a decline tendency in modern language learning, not only in higher education, but down to the school level, especially in the UK. However, we need to see a broad picture, particularly maybe from a, a university level or in university infrastructure level. Uh, no matter how excellent our uh, our modern language program is and how good your students' learning experience is, the key fact which brings to the fundamental change is how our university operates. Here I listed down a generic infrastructure of the higher education UK. As you could see, the university runs his uh, run his structure as an up and down pyramid. We all under the umbrella of the university, then belong to a certain college, school, and the department, and the end come to our uh, subject area. So if allow me to using my higher education institute here. It, so it's okay? Yeah, don't worry, continue. Okay, it's just all right. Like okay, so if you allow me using my higher education institute, here is the University of Edinburgh as an example. As you can see, my subject area of Chinese study is right under the bottom of this up and down pyramid. The, uh, the opportunity or env uh, environment of what a Chinese study has is under this bureaucratic uh, structure. In other words, uh, the policy made at the senior level will directly bring the impact to our program. As the chart uh, on the right hand side, you could see the number of students took uh, Chinese language courses at the undergraduate level. It's gradually growing in past four years. Very interesting. Uh, of, uh, overall, uh, it maintains on roughly same uh, levels as an uh, Asian language comparing with the other uh, popular European language, such as French and Spanish, the number of students in Chinese language program is sustainable and healthy, uh, I would say in this way. Uh, the reason at the first is university in infrastructure greatly contribute to the success of modern language program in LSE here. By saying this, you could see the degree structure in our university or something like that. Same to most of the other university degree, uh, degree could be divided into two levels, undergraduate and uh, postgraduate. There are four years for undergraduate degree and in normal circumstances, there is a one year for postgraduate course as we are offering Chinese study with Chinese language input. So in our case, uh, our students need two years to complete his or her postgraduate course. However, as you could see, there's also a line drawn between year two and year three on undergraduate level. So foundation, year one, year two, we call them pre-honor degree. And from year three above, we call it honor degree. Okay. So we, why do I need to show the degree structure? Is our university encourage a strong cross-disciplinary studies to the students at the pre-owner level? So on the basis of credit, students need to complete 120 credit course like most of other higher education uh, higher in institutes in UK or Europe. Thanks to the pre-owner structure, our students are allowed to choose up to 40 credit course from the other subject area. That means students, for example, uh, from medical school in theory, are able to choose a up to 40 credit language course if they have the capacity. This means from the way of Chinese language program, we could see a guaranteed number of students who are taking Chinese language annually, which in terms help us to maintain the stability of our program. On top of it, on the pre-owner level, students are allowed to swap the degree to a great extent. So we have been seeing and dealing with many cases that the students change their original degree to our degree of Chinese study after studying accredited credit course from us. 
to ensure the number of students taking Chinese language course and to in, uh, enable the possibility for students changing the subject area on the pre-owner stage. It is up to a language program and his curricular design. How could we ensure those possibility and the change? So it is down to us to work on Chinese language program in order to achieve the most interest on the base of the, such a successful structure. So the first job for our Chinese language program is to distinguish the nature of students and the desire. As you could see here, we, did that, we divide students into two initial group, degree students and outside students. Outside students means those students from diff uh, different discipline areas. Uh, within degree uh, st students, we have a single owner of Chinese study, joint owner and the minor combined degree. Those students who come from different discipline area, we need to ask us why they choose to study Chinese language. So they can be uh, with interest or some student come in with a commitment. So with a commitment, those students who desire to learn Chinese or already learn the Chinese at school level and would keep Chinese language going along with their own subjects in order to strengthen the future employment profile. All those students, uh, they have some interest, but not serious enough. So, uh, but they want to have a try and see how it's going. So let me focus on this group of students at first to demonstrate how we design our course to fit for the learning purposes. So as some of outside students choosing the course because of interest, so we would like nurturing his or her interest we designed the course as a combination of cross-cultural awareness and language learning. Learning will encourage students to have a word will and see the difference in the values and customers between China and the students' own culture. Therefore, the learners adjust their behave in practice to enrich with the cross-cultural knowledge. It builds up a learning background as well as lay down the foundation for students to understand the, the relation between the language, thought, and the culture. Uh, along with the cross-cultural learning, learning, we choose a localized textbook for Chinese language teaching, which is uh, to approach language uh, studies from the student's personal experience so students won't feel the alienation of a kid or culture, mm -hmm. as well as to develop the five language learning skills, mm -hmm. such as speaking, listening, reading, writing, and translation. So uh, I will see this dash line here is mean because this course is developed uh, uh, offered in two semesters. So you, you can see the intro if a group of students choose introductory Chinese, and when they come uh, uh, semester two, they also can choose the upper level in introductory Chinese uh, two. So we often see there were half of students will choose the the upper level after learning with us in the first semester. So uh, generally speaking is, um, yes, uh, half of them is not too bad. For um, And uh, let's back to the degree uh, students and those outside the student, but with a great commitment. Um, there are 40 credit uh, year long intensive courses, up to eight direct teaching hours per week available for students to choose. As you could see, language learner, uh, learning will take up a great proportion in these courses. So for a, a, for a pre-owner stage, we are offering from beginner level up to an intermediate level. As, as they are all pre-owner courses, so year one and two undergraduate students are free to choose any of them according to a language proficiency. Postgraduate students are also allowed to on the course, but uh, for auditing with uh, concession. So Chinese is an um, Asian language. It's a, it has a special needs and rules to learn. Uh, although all the courses are composed of five elements, you can see here, uh, but uh, those components are slightly different. 
So at the beginner level, we focus speaking, character writing, and grammar learning. At the intermediate level, we move on character writing to reading and writing. And the one element is brought in, which is cross-cultural studies with focus on pragmatic language learning. If a student chooses upper intermediate Chinese, then Chinese literature is brought in and re to replace the grammar, we aim to develop students' Chinese literacy, which is a very important part to our Chinese culture and students' professional development. So I would point out here, each course is co-taught by a team. So students will see at least the five different faces to hear very, uh, five, uh, five different teachers speaking languages or speaking Chinese. So the, uh, the teaching task have to be, uh, have to destructured into uh, different elements. So they could build up students' confidence. So they don't see Chinese as a whole and feel scared to attack, attack this task. So instead they will see different components within, within this language. They will see why his or her weakness is and where the strength, strength is. We often see a case for example, if it is a module taught by one teacher, if students dislike the teacher's teaching style, then dis dislike the subject. Now we have five or six teachers in one course, so I'm sure they must have one, one teacher they, they found out of it. So uh, towards the end, because I only have 10 minutes, I want to mention is our HR resources. Um, uh, so our de uh, our departmental staff contribute to the man language elements. Well, we also have hourly paid teachers, postgraduate students, and outside resources such as Confucian Institute teachers. The only uh, those teacher here they only contribute to our oral tutorials. Often they are young and uh, they will bring many new perspective, modern life of China, and share the youth culture with them. Students generally really like uh, the oral tutorials. Okay, so at the last, from students' perspective, the curricular design fits for the learning purpose, intensively or learning casually. So breaking down the task, reduce the learner's anxiety and help a teacher to find a way to improve a particular student's learning area. So co-taught calls show the pragmatic Chinese but under the same, but under one course organizer who will make sure the coherence between the different components. After all, I want to emphasize here is only the structure from the university or senior level could make the model possible and successful. So uh, I probably leave the question towards the end. And uh, thank you so much. And this is my session. So if you want to follow me on the social media Twitter, and this is the link. Or if you're interested in Chinese language teaching, so you can contact me either through my uh, university email account. So many thanks. Xie xie. Great, thank you. We will leave all the discussion and the questions towards the end. Sorry, I forgot to mention. So now let's pass on to our second panelist, uh, Wei Shao, please, from University of Cardiff. Um, thank you, Catherine. I'll just share my screen. Is it working? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, so uh, what I'm presenting you today is a uh, coursework slash assessment which we use to develop learners' writing skills. Um, so here at Cardiff, we have two BA, full-time BA Chinese programs. Um, so this is the um, assessment uh, for our year one module. Um, so the method is called a reflective language learning portfolio. A portfolio is essentially a collection of a student's work. Um, so as the student progress through the course, each week they generate a huge amount of work. So what we ask them to do is to divide them into a number of categories. For example, you can see on the screen, we've got seven categories here. And then we ask them to basically um, arrange it and then um, put them into this folder if you like. Okay, so our year one students actually have two levels. So they're complete beginners and also some of them are intermediate uh, learners. So we provide the framework for this piece of uh, coursework. 
but within each category, for example, um, vocabulary practice, they actually can decide exactly what content goes into each category. So we give them that autonomy to decide what's really relevant to themselves. So let's just have a, a snapshot of what the portfolio looks like inside. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, our students have different levels. So this is just a character drill. So they can decide which characters they find that need practicing. Okay, so we give them that um, decision. Okay, also uh, after each, um, each week, we ask them to summarize the key knowledge they, that, that they, they find most relevant to themselves. So for example, um, key language patterns, key sentences, and the vocabulary again, which they find most relevant to themselves. Um, so also, so, so lecture notes, absolutely uh, very personalized. So it doesn't have to be one format. So whatever works for students. So this is really actually useful um, for them when it comes to the final uh, exams. They can actually go back using this portfolio, I say, um, revise, um, it's, it's a really good resource for uh, revision. Okay, so here are just more examples of, of uh, what kind of work that goes in. So when they do normal uh, coursework, so they get feedback from the tutor. For example, I'm not sure that you can see on top here, maybe the uh, senior is uh, covering it. So actually this is a draft. So in the middle, I'm looking at the middle here. This is the draft essay. So they write the first draft. The tutor corrects the first draft. And then the student writes second draft, and then that, that goes in after this first draft. That's what you can see here. Um, so yeah, so they get a feedback from the tutor. Okay, uh, so students will not get marked down by how many errors occurred in their course work. So you, so they might have made a lot of errors, but as long as they correct them, as long as they reflect on them, they can still get really high marks. Okay, so it's not. So we're not marking their language competence here. We're, we're marking on how reflective they are and how comprehensive this portfolio is. So the reason, um, the, the rationale behind this is we want to use this um, learner-centered approach. So, the, so, um, so research has suggests that um, when learner takes ownership of their, of their own learning, um, learning actually um, takes place better so they are in charge of their learning. So they, so they are given the guideline, but they can actually uh, personalize um, their own coursework. So there's one element I would like to focus on here. It's called reflective diaries. Okay. So um, the first rationale about this element is it really encourage encourages learner to um, keep tra keep track of their learning journey. Um, so I will give you some examples here this is one of my students um reflective diary so this student likes bullet points so she doesn't like writing long text so she's putting in a key language pattern that she found most useful from this lesson and also um errors that she she uh, she find these two phrases are synonyms which are easily confused they're saying this is not same as that and also she's taken on feedback from the tutor, which uh, says you should use more of your uh, knowledge you've learned in today's lesson and put them in, in the essay afterwards. Okay, so this is just her style of reflecting on her own learning history. So this student is, is uh, writing that first she found it a little bit hard and then after Tuesday lesson, she found it easy, right? So this is uh, an example of when someone reflects on their own learning experience as a learner or as a as a practitioner on a, in an ongoing fashion. Um, so to me, as a tutor, as her tutor, I actually, to me, that's really valuable feedback because Tuesday, I know Tuesday lesson is a, um, is a is one of our key lectures of of the week, so where they get taught key uh, language structures. So I actually found um, 
that she actually found it helpful. So, so to me, that's really, really valuable. Okay. Um, so to her, perhaps she will prioritize Tuesday less in the future. A second rationale of learning, uh, sorry, uh, reflective diary is that it, it gives the learner a greater picture of themselves and in order to encourage them to, to become independent learners. This is an example of a uh, diary, okay? So uh, two, there are two themes going on here. Uh, first of all, uh, this, this learner uh, wrote, she, she, she first found it hard, but she actually got it through writing essays. So to me, that this learner has realized a method of learning which applies for her, okay? So through writing, through actually practicing, that's how she gets um, the language knowledge, okay? Um, also, if you look further, she, she says, um, I find reading a bit easier, but actually memorizing the pattern of the character is quite hard. So there she identifies her strengths and weaknesses. So she gets a greater picture of herself as a Chinese learner. Another rationale that we have is um, reflective diaries helps them to become uh, analytical and a critical uh, problem solver, okay? So uh, in, in the process of language acquisition, it actually enhances their creativity as an adult learner. Uh, here's an example. So this student actually compares a Chinese um, language pattern with uh, English. So this student is a native English speaker. So this is, uh, she's contrastively analyzing the, between his, her first language and her second language. Um, so although uh, some of these elements are taught in the lectures, but I think for learners to reflect them on a the personal level, so without prompting them, they actually initiated the learning process. I think they will have a greater experience of learning and also the knowledge will stick with them longer. Here's another example. So this is another uh, British student who who's doing Chinese, but interestingly, she's doing Japanese as well. So she's actually reflecting between her second language and third language, okay? Uh, there's also, so she finds uh, Japanese slightly easier than Chinese to learn because Chinese, uh, uh, because the uh, writing system in Japanese is phonetic, whereas in Chinese, it isn't. Uh, so there's no way as a tutor, I could give her that knowledge knowing that she's doing Japanese, okay? So, to, uh, so that gives me a, a clear picture of the learner herself. And also it provides evidence that she, she now has a new awareness of how the phonetic properties of, of a foreign language could impact her learning experience. So in the future, if she decides to take another East Asian language on, for example, Korean or, or Vietnamese, uh, Korean does have a phonetic writing system, so she will realize, okay, I can do Korean relatively easily compared to what, what, what I've committed to Chinese. So, so, so that's a really uh, useful a process for the learner to go through. Uh, so that's all I'm uh, sharing with you today. I hope I'm haven't gone over 10 minutes. Thank you so much. You're perfectly on time. Thank you so much, Wei. Okay, uh, let's then welcome our final speaker, Jing, Dr. Shi. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Hello. Hello. Yeah. That's great. Um, now let me share the screen with you. Okay. Hi, I'm Li Jing Shi. I'm from London School of Economics. Today I'm going to talk about an eye tracking research on students' reading skills. Um, it's really a nice coherent um, coincidence because I'm going to talk about a little bit about a reflection as well, which actually my previous college, uh, colleague has already mentioned. So that can save a bit of time. And also we have a nice angle because the first we talk about policy, the second one talk about teaching. I'm just going to show a little bit of my research. 
Okay, so um, basically, I have two research questions. So, what do learners focus on when they are reading, and why? And then, what strategies do they apply when they are reading, and then outside of the classroom? All right. So. The next slide you can see is my research method. So actually it's a mixed research method. First, I use eye tracker, a portable eye tracker to uh, record the students' eye movements when they are reading some reading comprehension tasks on the screen. The second one is the stimulated recall uh, interviews. Actually, uh, basically when the eye tracking eye tracking recording stopped, I invite the students to watch the recording with me and ask them to explain why they do that when they are reading. And after that, they also tell me how they approach Chinese learning. All right, so here is a glance of my participants. Um, so basically you can see I have three uh, total beginners. They are not even degree students. They are our certificate, uh, certificate course students. So they learn 40 hours uh, during the whole year. And then I also have a very high level of mastery students. They are degree students. Uh, so their level already reach C1 slash C2. And I think I have um, international students background, but also one student from Hong Kong to give us a little bit of information on the really high end of our learners. All right, so for because the time is quite limited, so I will just uh, um, go quite quickly about the eye tracking data. So the here you can see is called heat map. Basically, the longer you look at something, the heat map will get hotter, redder. Okay. So this beginner has a weaker uh, reading skills. So he actually spent more time looking at the characters. This part doesn't have pinyin. So he needs more time to figure out what's the meaning it is. And then this student is a more fluent beginner. So he doesn't need too much time. And then when there's, uh, sorry, when there's uh, pinyin available, when both pinyin and the character available, weaker students still look at the pinyin uh, because they want to get some confirmation from the pinyin. And this one shows how they read. When they read, whether they read leniently or they can actually like our, like advanced readers jumping around very quickly, glance information and get the key message out of it. And then we can see here for beginners, they really read one word by word. It's very much lenient. You can see all the numbers that indicates how they eye move. <coughs> okay, now, uh, let's look at this is the beginners and then here is the mastery and I find this is the most interesting part. You can see although they are all in the mastery class but because of this heritage student uh, she lived in Hong Kong for 12 years before she came to uh, UK to study. So you can still see this great gap between someone is uh, non-native and someone it has grown up in that language environment. And then the next one, again, uh, you can see the, for non-Harris students, it's much easier. And although Qi and Jin are very high level mastery students, but they still read more or less leniently. Okay, so glance like advanced readers for them is very, very difficult. Okay, so the, I, <laughs> so after the eye tracking, I invite them to look at these pictures. So that is certainly amazed them and trick them to reflect on what they have been learning. So um, here I just can show you some of the interview quotations. So for example, some learners like Bi De, he has very clear learning motivation. He wants to go to uh, Shanghai. So he really focus on characters. Right. Um, and then also learners like Laura, she doesn't know how to, she, it's her first time to learn Chinese. So she needs someone to hang on to when we talk about uh, Chinese characters. So she said, oh, we, we need to know the basics. So I think uh, like uh, head component, uh, stroke order must be included even for beginner course students. 
And then uh, here we also see some students really like characters, you know, no matter this one in at a very high level and a low level, they don't mind. It seems like when they accept Chinese learning in all repetitive, they, they, they just accept it and then they can do it, right? But it's not everyone like that. And then also we can look at uh, uh, for higher level students, whether they use the uh, top-down reading skills to help them understand. And then we can see actually both heritage students and non-native speakers can do this, right? Not only just the na native speakers. Um, <clears throat> So the last one is very interesting is it shows two totally different kinds of reading strategy. One, Jean on one side, she's, he's very rigid, but he is like uh, basically every, he's learning every single character, every phrases put down, pinyin, English translation and um, a sentence. But however, his fluency is not uh, as good as uh, say Qi, she is a Finnish student, but uh, her fluency from my observation is better than Ji Mu. So, and then you can see uh, Qi use wider range of uh, kind of learning skills. It's a different way. So she likes to read a lot, watch a lot. I think this kind of extensive reading and watching or input helped her in uh, fluency. Uh, okay, so just to kind of sum up, uh, I think uh, from this small pilot study, I only had uh, six students at two levels. I already can see a wider range of uh, reading strategies have been used. But why they use that from the interview, I found out it can be personal personality. For example, Jim, he's a super organized student. He wants everything in place. So the uh, phrase, translation, painting, example, this kind of format suits him very well. But also to do with his previous learning, learning experience, because he was taught that way when he was in high school and he found it useful, effective, so he carried on doing that. Okay, but also uh, reading habits in other languages. Actually, many of my students are multilingual. multilingual. They can speak uh, three to five different languages. So the, the reading um, habits or styles in other languages also had uh, influence on reading in Chinese. But I also want to point out that the top-down strategy matters a lot. I found that actually even for higher level students, they don't use this context, they don't use this particular particular strategy very much. They, they, uh, so we always teach them to get the meaning from context, but while come to the reading comprehension, sometimes they can't do it. And also I found the repetitively writing characters is really important for beginners, but when you come to the mastery level, the, the effect kind of wind off. So we need to let them try different things, encourage them to try different things. And then I think for beginners and the masters, mastery students, they need the different types of training. We need to provide them with different support. Okay, so just to, to uh, because of the time, I have to just end it here. So I think uh, it's true in any language, uh, fluent reading is rapid, active, uh, comprehending, flexible, and then gradually developed. I think the comparison between the comparison between non-native speaker and the Harris students is kind of revealing to show you know how long does it take to be a skilled, speedy, friend reader in Chinese. And also, I feel we have more dedicated teaching on reading strategy. You know, while we are teaching, I think that could help our learners to enjoy learning Chinese a bit more, to tackle that 
uh, strategically. I think uh, the, my previous uh, speaker yeah. said the problem solver to solve the problem. And also our teaching need to be stage appropriate. You know, certain tasks, certain training suitable for certain level of learners. And also, yes, very importantly, help them to reflect on learning. So using eye tracking, using the way I conduct research is one way of helping them to reflect on for them to see using their own eyes how they are reading. Also, my previous speaker also using the diary, which is perfectly fun as well. So we just want students to be strategic and reflective. I think by helping them to do so, we can make our Chinese teaching more sustainable, more successful. Okay, that's all for my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, email me. <laughs> and then here is some key reference for the eye tracking research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Li Jing. Uh, if you could stop sharing, we're just going to bring everyone to the main room. Okay, wonderful. Um, first, Thank you all the speakers for sharing. And I think it's very interesting from different perspective and both in terms of pedagogy as well as research. I just wanted, I, I actually posed a question back to our uh, colleagues in the room. How do we get questions from the audience? Is there any way to understand if there is any specific questions from the audience? So if they have questions, um, if they, could let us know whether the question is for everybody on the panel, or maybe there will be questions that is directed at one of the panelists. Uh, okay, we would like, if, if possible, uh, quite a simple question because it was really an uh, interesting panel. Great. But we do not know anything about Chinese. We understand <laughs> probably very, very difficult language to learn. So uh, I have a question. Uh, Something like what level uh, do the students achieve after, let's say, one year of uh, studying Chinese? Great. Um, should we take turns? I think this is actually a kind of very typical question. Okay. I guess my, my answer would be, would you learn it for? Okay, I think one of the distinctive nature of the Chinese language, you can completely separate the written system as well as, as opposed to the speaking the spoken language. So if you want to be fluent because you don't care about reading and writing Chinese at all, you just want to focus on listening and speaking, building con communicative skills, you can learn it quite quickly. However, you want to be really comprehensive and learn everything and then learn, let's say, five to 2,000 Chinese characters, be able to read the basic stuff. Of course, that's going to take longer. So that's my kind of a simple take. Um, anyone on the panel? Go ahead, please. Uh, I agree with Catherine is how, uh, how much input students give to this particular language. For our degree course, uh, for undergraduate uh, Chinese study, students have to learn this language uh, uh, as a degree course and uh, intensive, uh, intensively learning the language. So after one year, the good students may receive B1 level. <gasps> And then we also have, a, like we say, foundation course because they have less hours and uh, the input is much lesser. So we will assume around uh, A2 level. Yeah, um, yeah so in, in our institution, it's very similar to that in America. We also, we're also a full-time BA degree program. <laughs> After one year, we would expect them to reading and writing achieved to uh, HSK level three, that's equivalent to B1 ish that's about 600 characters. Um, in terms of speaking and listening, I really find it's really difficult to improve very quickly while you're in a foreign country, uh, while you're in, the, in your home country. So I find their speaking and listening really take off when they, when they actually go abroad during their year abroad. Uh, so primarily when they're in the UK, we basically just preparing them for their year abroad. And so, so our approach is leave the speaking and listening perhaps to when, when they go abroad. Because when they come home, when they come back to UK, they just completely transformed their speaking and their confidence and all that. Yeah, so it's in terms of um, uh, competency, it's very similar to, to uh, Lando's 
uh, cohort. Thank you. Uh, but I want to just say a little bit that we find an interesting case is when the students come in, they, there's a, a non-background, they never learn Chinese at all after four years study with us. And also we have students come in with some kinds of background and continue study Chinese with us. After four years, four years study, we find the best students often is students come in without any background. Yeah, so, yeah. so they, they study uh, the language in the systematic way from us. And we find the their they progression is um, much, much uh, greater than those students students come in with background. Mm. Yeah, I also see that pattern. Yeah. Interestingly, it'd be interesting to find out, <laughs> maybe to do a research about why. Yeah, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Li Jing, do you have anything to add or shall we move yeah, on to the next question? One more question, if possible. Yeah, if I can yeah. ask you, but uh, maybe it's a, it's a stupid question. I'm, I'm sorry, because I have, I have no idea. I love Chinese, so not, not at all. But, uh, it's also interesting to, to follow your um, mentioning the, the, the eye tracking because uh, uh, of the text. Because my father was a quite famous uh, Czech ophthalmologist, and I'm just wondering if uh, if you somehow cope with uh, eye doctors or with ophthalmologists when doing this research or, or doing this study. Uh, okay. Okay. That's for Lijing. Yes. All right. I, if I understand, it, because your voice was a little bit low, so it's a bit difficult uh -huh. to hear. Uh, so your question is whether anyone else is doing eye tracking uh, studies. Uh, uh, if you somehow cooperate with uh, ophthalmologists, because my father, our eye doctors, uh, my, my father uh, was an ophthalmologist, so uh, that's why I'm interested in this field of. Uh, medicine, and if if you somehow cope with uh, eye doctors uh, in in your research, oh, the, you to cope with to cope with the eye lodgers. Uh, so basically, eye tracking has been used actually quite for a long time, at least uh -huh. in reading research has been for 100 years. And then uh, in interface, like interface design, when we design a web page or we uh, design a kind of APP, you know, application, this kind of uh, uh, human computer interaction uh, research with eye tracking has been for 30 years, mm -hmm. right? And then eye tracking using, uh, your eye tracker used to be very expensive and it usually in the past is kind of ta uh, take part in an eye tracking research is like a suffering. So your head has to be kind of uh, fixed in a certain point, yeah. you can't move yeah. it, like a torture. Uh -huh. But in my research, I was lucky to borrow a portable eye tracker, can click on to a laptop. And uh -huh. then also because more and more people are using the eye tracker or eye tracking, uh, are doing eye tracking research, the equipment is slightly cheaper at the moment. Yeah, I think, and then some people, if they have really good um, IT skills, they can program themselves. So uh, that's the current development of uh, eye tracking research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. It's really interesting. Great. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, I thought, because we didn't cover uh, one uh, little point from our initial slide is about COVID. Mm -hmm. So very quick question to all the panelists. Do you see it as an opportunity, particularly threat or opportunity in terms of teaching Chinese, given that maybe a lot of what we do have to be moved online? I was thinking particularly in Xiaowei's case, all your portfolio, now you need gloves and you need students to, how do they give it to you? You know, all this kind of logistic issue, but more broadly, do you see how it's going to shape the future of Chinese language learning in what particular way? So any thoughts from the panelists? We, we're actually not doing portfolio this year. Um, it is not feasible. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, but yeah. You, yeah, so I, what, you, what are you going to do instead this year? Uh, we, we're, I think we're, we're doing more online assessment. So okay. um, in terms of exams, we would we turn them into online assessment. So you use uh, the yeah, so you we, use we use, similar right. methodology, but online delivery. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. I, I suppose if, if, it, if we want them to write reflective diaries, that could also be yeah. recorded online. Um, so I, I feel personally, I feel like the, the biggest threat to us comes, comes from their year abroad. 
if, this, okay. if they can't physically be in a in a target learning environment, how can we replicate that? It's, it's very hard. Sure. Okay. Um, so we, we, in terms of mitigation, we can only we can only provide provide extra classes, extra uh, workshop, but it's not going to be the same if if you can't yeah. travel to a. Um, yeah, so China. mobility issue, but yeah. hopefully that's going to be, you yeah. know, <laughs> solved in a few years' time. Okay. Think, um, yeah, apart from that, I think everything could be rectified uh, online. Right. It, it could work. Yeah. Uh, Li Jing, what about you? Uh, I, you know me, I'm always uh, go for online teaching. I think it's a great opportunity for us because I think online teaching can cater for wider range of learning needs. And also, also gives both students and the teacher more flexibility to try things uh -huh. out and tr um, can, can be more interactive. Uh, of course, you know, we need more trainings on that. But sure, I sure. see actually teaching online as a, as a kind of threat or as a huge challenge yeah i think uh, study abroad is uh, like um, more challenging so maybe we have to think about like a uh, virtual reality or some sort <laughs> 2d glasses yes, playing, I, I... playing some kind of video games <laughs> <laughs> yeah i do want to echo to that i mean obviously technology help right so now we can teach given the within the same time zone, it really just offers more opportunity. We, we probably can reach out to more people, but obviously slightly different if we talk about undergraduate degree as such mobility and the part of our program cannot change so quickly. Um, so finally, uh, Bando. Okay. Um, uh, at the moment, because uh, we just mentioned uh, from next week uh, is uh, our term we're going to start. But more or less, I see this COVID-19 and then lead to our to doing hybrid teaching. And the way I see is a great opportunity, to be honest, because we're stuck in this traditional teaching method, in this traditional environment, it's been so long, many hundred years. We need to do something, it's the 21st century. And then we, because we are so busy and tied up with the other works, so we never really think about it. But I think COVID-19 is a good opportunity put this way, I know I have many downside, but one way is push us to move everything online. And we find we can do it and we can do it brilliant if you've been creative and then you're thinking, planning carefully and uh, we can offer students more because when back to March when we uh, in during this lockdown period and we, we move a lot of teaching online, for example, reading and writing, we find the students get more attention from the classroom. Right. And there's a lot of things that certainly we can do online, but of course there, there were some elements like oral tutorial we find it's difficult, but that's why we do a hybrid teaching, but most of the other things we certainly can move online. And the, I think even when COVID-19 is gone, we're back to a new normal or normal, I think I would want to keep still keep some element online and doing this uh, uh, a flick club, mm -hmm. a classroom, and then uh, do a more uh, a new way to teach. Yeah, new norm, going to the new norm. Great, I'm very glad we end on a very positive term. And it says we need to, as teachers, reflect a little bit more in terms of how we deliver and how we approach the subject as well. So thank you very much. And back to room, back to room 44. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so we also would like to thank you, Catherine, and your wonderful panelists for very interesting uh, panel discussion. And hopefully, we will see each other in the future face to face. Yeah, so we wish you good luck with your Chinese students. And see you. Bye bye. See you. Thank bye -bye. you very much. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody.